Hi everybody, this is Unit 1, a contested but enduring dominant global imaginary of the course Paradoxes of Ethics and Internationalization, 523A. So today we're going to be talking about um, global imaginary, the dominant global imaginary, but we're going to start with the context of global education, which is the main context where I work. And it's important to understand that context to understand where this conversation is coming from. So I, def I have defined for some time now global education as the intersection of three different spheres, the self, the other, and local and global contexts. In this, in, at this intersection, there are perceptions, relationships, and flows of knowledge, of power, of information, and perceptions that uh, establish how we relate between these spheres. And this, of course, happens in the context of globalization, which I define as advanced capitalism, vast international migration, ecological fragility, technological interconnectivity, cultural hybridity, and a reconfiguration of political power. So global education, then, is at the intersection of the three spheres, but focus very much on the interfaces between the spheres and it is concerned um, with education as an enlargement of possibilities for living together in complex diverse uncertain and unequal global societies so within this context we are asking questions about what it means to be alive uh, in the world that we have today, what connects us to each other, what connects us to the world. And what we see in the patterns of connections that we have today is that there is an enduring dominant pattern of relationships. And that's the pattern of relationships that this video is going to focus on. So in order to talk about global imaginaries, I'll start with this definition that comes <coughs> from the literature on social imaginaries. It says that social imaginaries provide both a subtle, descriptive, and normative framework for what things are and what they should be. As they ground common sense, social imaginaries or global imaginaries delimit the parameters of problem spaces for inquiry and research and thus restrict the choices of questions worth asking in the criteria for the adequacy and validity of possible answers. So a global imaginary, in this case, especially a dominant one, is what determines the realm of intelligibility, of what makes sense to us. Outside of the global imaginary, there's, no, no, there's nonsense. Uh, within the global imaginary, we perceive uh, there is what is familiar. And generally, the dominant global, global imaginary, within the dominant global imaginary, we will perceive this global imaginary as all-encompassing. So what is beyond the global imaginary apart from not making sense, sometimes doesn't even exist from the perception of those inside the global imaginary. But in order to illustrate all of this, we're going to try to do that through metaphor. We're going to try to use metaphorical examples. So the first metaphorical example is this one. I'm going to invite you to imagine a field of corn with ripe corn cobs. Harvest your corn and take off the husks and place all your corn cobs in front of you. Now I'm going to ask you to compare your corn cobs to the corn cobs in the picture that I'm going to show next. So normally when I ask people to have a look at this picture and compare it to the corn cobs they have in their minds, generally their, their own corn cobs, the imagined corn cobs, are yellow and generally more or less uniform. So I use this as a metaphor to show how our imagination has been colonized by one one form of corn cob. We can only imagine the yellow form of corn, car, corn cob because we haven't been exposed to the other varieties. So as a metaphor, this, the yellow corn cob, the dominance of the yellow corn cob represents a hegemonic form of ethnocentrism. That represents an arrogance and deafness to what does not fit one's global framework. So if we imagine the yellow corn cob as the example of the dominant global imaginary, we will see a normalization of social hierarchies and a denial of heterogeneity in terms of how we imagine social relations, how we imagine security, how we imagine um, education, the idea of proper clothing, contracts, um, punishment, um, organization, governance, <coughs> religion, and justice. And this is the problem of imagining the world as uh, just one thing. And there is a historicity to it. So why we imagine the world in a certain way comes from our histories, our cultures, our, culture, our, our reference. And this is part 
of what this course is going to try to unsettle. We're going to try to make the familiar strange and the strange familiar through engagement with different literature. There are with literature and text that are going to challenge, uh, in a good way, <laughs> the ways we uh, understand the world and what has been normalized and made natural for us in our socialization, in our history within modernity. So, uh, another example now, this, this is a practical example of how this dominant global, global imaginary operates, is a um, survey question that was applied in schools in England from 1996 to 2007. It was called the Modi School Omnibus Survey conduct, conducted by the Department for International Development of the English government. And what I'm going to show is one of the questions that students in secondary schools had to answer about their understandings of the globe, of globalization, and of others. So I would like to invite you to imagine you are a student in a school in England, and you're answering a survey, and you have this question. How can poorer countries affect us in the UK? And you have several options to choose from for your answer. So option one, uh, by getting us involved in their conflicts. So by getting us in the UK involved in their conflicts. Option two, by increasing risks of diseases spreading in the UK. Number three, by increasing the number of people wanting to live here. Number four, by affecting our jobs and our economy. And number five, by, damage, by damaging the Earth's environment, actually there's a number six, by making our foreign holidays more dangerous. Now, um, I would like to think a little bit about this and see if you find any problems with this um, options for the response. Of course, as you are um, answering this as a student in the schools uh, in England, um, the way that the question was framed and the possibilities were uh, scripted for you already um, reproduces a way of thinking about the world where the other is perceived as only affecting us negatively. And there are more uh, aspects to these uh, responses that we need to dig deeper um, in this course. Um, one of them is the relational construction of the self and the other. It's not just the, that the other is perceived as negative, but that by perceiving the other as negative, we're perceiving the self in very positive and benevolent ways. So, for example, by seeing the other as always involved in war uh, and, and related to violence, so the other is violent, therefore the self is peaceful. The other is ill, the self is healthy. Number three, the other is uh, aspires to be like here because here is really good, therefore there it's really bad. Uh, by affecting our jobs and our economy, we have a good economy. They have um, haven't managed to uh, have the knowledge to construct their own. So we are intelligent. They are ignorant. By damaging the Earth's environment, they are the ones who pollute. We are the ones who save the Earth and who recycle. And by making our foreign uh, holidays more dangerous, we are just reproducing the idea that we are entitled to go to their land um, and have safe holidays while they cannot really, they should not really aspire um, to come and live amongst us here as equals. So this is another example of this division of the global imaginary where part of humanity is told that they are intelligent, benevolent, deserving, clean, capable, and have this capacity for leadership, while the other part is told and also believes sometimes that they're ignorant, violent, uh, they are prone to destruction, prone to servitude, they're unsanitary, and less deserving than the other part. So if we take this as a problem in education, especially in global education or education for global citizenship or internationalization, <coughs> we'll see that uh, this is not an easy, an easy issue to address, especially if we have been um, ourselves socialized in the same imaginary. And we're, I'm not saying that this imaginary is only conscious, right? All the institutions around us, uh, to, to different degrees, the modern institutions that we, uh, we, we inhabit, they, if they reproduce this imaginary, this is part of the way that um, 
we have been conditioned to feel. So how do we let go of something that is so ingrained in our culture if we perceive this as a problem? So one of the ways to frame the problem here uh, of, of this imaginary is that it, produ it produces enduring problematic patterns of relationships. In these relationships, I've tried to, um, to produce a, 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 with an acronym uh, what these patterns are. So here you have the first pattern. These are relationships and uh, representations that we have of one side in relation to the other is that they are hegemonic. Uh, they reinforce and justify the status quo, especially because the side that is seen to, is perceived to have knowledge of worth um, wants to help those who um, are perceived to be lacking that knowledge. So there is this impulse to help others by giving others what we already have and what we perceive to be of universal worth. So in partnerships or engagements in that direction, these initiatives tend to be hegemonic in the sense that they, they do not question um, the positionality that we have today. They do not question the universality of this knowledge. They do not question this global imaginary. So that's the first pattern. The second pattern is that they are ethnocentric. They project one view as universal. This is related to hegemonic, but ethnocentric um, is something that happens in many different cultures. But for it to be ethnocentric and hegemonic, these cultures have to have the power to make that definition stick. And not all cultures have that power. It's generally the dominant culture that has that power. Um, another characteristic of these relationships is that they are ahistorical. They forget historical legacies and complicities. So you have a lot of people here in England, for example, sometimes going to countries in Africa and believing that they're just giving away uh, education and computers and technology and science. But they do not consider how they have historically participated in the production of the inequalities in these African uh, countries and contexts. So that's the ahistorical dimension that I'm talking about. They're also depoliticized. These relationships and representations disregard power inequalities and ideologies. So the inequality in terms of uh, access to resources or worth of knowledge is perceived to be natural and it's just a matter of transfer from those who have more knowledge, more resources to another without realizing that we are part of systemic um, processes that really distribute uh, the value of individuals and the resources unequally from the outset. Um, the other uh, pattern is that these relationships tend, tend to be salvationist and self-serving. They are invested in self-congratulatory heroism. So we go there to make a difference so that we can feel good about ourselves. <coughs> and that, in one way, um, is, <laughs> is a good intention, right? But the, the road to hell is also paved with them. But um, if we're doing that for our own um, self-interest and benefit, then um, it just reproduces the systemic relationships that uh, we're going to talk more about in the text that uh, touch upon as well, and we're going to get there. These relationships are also based on uncom uncomplicated solutions that offer few good quick fixes without considering systemic patterns, historical patterns, and political problems um, in the context that they are intervening. And they are also paternalistic. They, um, it's, it, they are initiatives that start with the expectation of a thank you at the end. And that's extremely problematic as it creates already a predetermined, um, it's predetermined desires for a, a very specific, a specific form of outcome that is not very conducive to solidarity or to equality in a relationship or in a partnership, for example. So, I know I'm rushing a little bit because I want to make it uh, 20 minutes, make this video 20 minutes. So, in, in summary, we have a, a dominant global imaginary that is, that is contested, but is enduring, that is genderized, sexualized, racialized, and uh, that divides the world in very unequal ways in terms of 
um, unequal divisions of vulnerabilities, wealth, and labor. And I'm drawing on Spiva and Morrison to talk about this. And I use uh, this um, sculpture, which is called Justitia, to illustrate what, what I'm talking about in terms of, of this relationship. And uh, James Galshiot um, designed this, um, this sculpture for the World Social Forum um, um, a few years ago. And to illustrate something very difficult to talk about, which is the idea that the person who is uh, at the top of the man, uh, which is the goddess of justice, Justitia, is saying, I'm sitting at the back of a man, he's sinking under the burden, I'll do anything to help him except get off of his back. There's a problem with this picture in terms of gender relations. I don't think he quite got it right there. But what he really got, um, um, he, he really identified for us and that helps is the idea that this, this willingness to help those uh, who actually support our privilege, that if, if we believe that what we have today in terms of our capacity to educate ourselves and to, to feel that we can help other people is actually subsidized by the very people we want to help because the systems that sustain our privilege are the same systems that extract uh, their possibility to be in our position. If we start from that starting point of our complicity in systemic harm, the educational questions and possibilities also change to a greater degree. So if our global dominant global imaginary is one where um, we have a division between those who are perceived to be leading progress, um, development and human evolution through knowledge of universal value like the woman at the top who carries the scale of justice, defines justice and her, has her eyes closed and the divisions between these people and those who are told that um, they need to serve and they are dragging humanity uh, down or they are lagging behind, then we have a very specific um, task in addressing, um, in addressing this global imaginary in international and global education. And that's the discussion that I've been part of for the last 20 years. How do we do that? Uh, and is it a question of more knowledge that people need or is it a question that, of denial, that people deny that this global imaginary exists because it's too complicated and too complex for us to open that can of worms? So, and then we, we prefer to deny that, to continue to believe that we're good people just doing our best and, and we, don't, uh, we can't do anything about the systemic patterns. Uh, and if that is the case, how, how can, what can we do in education? How can we address these patterns? in education, in productive uh, ways that move discussions forward. So that's where my discussions, um, the discussions in this, in this area are at. So in terms of the course, what we're going to be doing in all the modules is that we are going to be engaging with this question uh, related to this global imaginary. We're going to look at several examples of people who have done so. And you are going to be asked to respond to these things uh, showing a level of self-reflexivity. So the next slide is a slide where I make a distinction between reflection and reflexivity. And I use the metaphor of a cake to talk about that. So at the top of the cake, there is what we say, what we do, and what we think. And um, in our education, generally, we tend to think that this is all connected. We say what we think, and we do what what we say and it's more complicated than that we don't uh, necessarily say what we think we don't necessarily do what we say <laughs> and um, we need to take account of these complexities so taking account of these complexities would be perceived to be a question of self-awareness that we are contradictory we're paradoxical bees and that that's okay um, these uh, ways of saying, doing, and thinking are grounded on individual experiences that are related to our unique context, our traumas, our passions, our joys, our um, specific families, and the trajectories that we have um, threaded in our lives. 
But these individual experiences are not necessarily all that individual because the frameworks we have to interpret these experiences are based on collective reference, reference uh, or discourses or languages that we have inherited to make sense of things. And these are collective, these are not individual. And these are related to ontological and epistemological assumptions that we carry with us that are systemic. So we, we, we are embedded in the systemic web. We have individual experiences within it that become quite unique, that then produce what we say, what we do, and what we think that, in the end, is very paradoxical, too. So in, the, in this context, I will call self-awareness an awareness of the disjunctures between what we say, what we do, and what we think. And I'll invite you to explore these things in the course, in your journals, and to dig, it's a space for you to dig deeply into contradictions and paradoxes uh, and big questions of what, what it means to live uh, in the world today when we are inheriting this global, dominant global imaginary and we are placed in, sometimes even in different parts of the global imaginary depending on who we are and at different points in time. The second layer of individual experiences, when we reflect on that, I'm calling it self-reflection. Uh, so when we're asking questions about what I think and why, in terms of my personal experiences, that is reflection. And that's important to do in the course as well. So thinking about your own individual trajectories. But I would like to invite you more <laughs> to open up to the possibility of doing some self-reflexive analysis analysis of the collective reference and stories that we tell ourselves, that our culture tells ourselves uh, about what's real, knowable, and ideal. So it's one step deeper um, where we are not questioning so much our individual choices, but the possibility of choices that we have been given at a specific historical moment and from a very specific cultural location. So this is, this is just a slide to explain a little bit uh, one way you can um, think about your responses to the tasks that you have today or this week, in the next two weeks. Um, and these are some of the dispositions that I'm thinking about um, in, in terms of um, thinking about the intentionality of the course. So self-reflexivity is one of them. I would like you to develop the disposition of self-reflexivity as a commitment to analyzing critically the collective reference and political projects of our individual thoughts so that we can see ourselves implicated in the issues and problems we are trying to address. I would like you to develop open and global-mindedness so that we will develop the strength and resilience necessary to construct other possible worlds together with others. Um, I would like you to develop critical historical memory so that we can learn to heal our historical pains to learn from the past and only make different mistakes in the future, not the same mistakes. Um, this, is, uh, this is what my students in the past have said that the course could do as, uh, and does uh, once they finish the course. Uh, and one of the things was okayness within the self so that we can learn to live with and not be overwhelmed by uncertainty, complexity, multiplicity, and agonistic conversations rather than antagonistic conversations. So I would like to invite you to be okay <laughs> with opening up lots of cans of worms um, and use the course to actually allow the worms to go out and not be afraid of what's going to happen. The worms are going to go back into the earth and they're going to fertilize new grounds for new ideas and new um, plants to come out. No, don't be afraid of paralysis or panic <laughs> or anything like that. We can all survive this intellectually. And I can assure you that mo all my students who have gone through courses like this have survived and have um, come out the other end much stronger, actually, and um, much uh, more open to the complexity of the world. The next disposition is humbleness as a safeguard against seeing ourselves as heading humanity or as having seen the light. Uh, relationality, mutuality, reciprocity, and hospitality so that we can develop the capacity to create solidarity, particularly with others who disagree with us, and divergent thinking and intellectual autonomy to keep conversations always open and alive for ourselves, for others, and for generations to come. 
So these are the dispositions that the course uh, is trying to develop. And different activities in the course will go uh, in, will, will be able to respond to different um, dispositions. Each one of them here has been thought through in terms of the design of the course. And I, um, I ask you to be patient uh, if, uh, in relation to this disposition. We're going to cover all of them, but not all of them all the time. And to finish off this presentation and to take it further, I would like to leave you with questions uh, related to that list of problems that I presented before. So these questions actually take the discussion further and, re and recognize that every solution to a problem actually creates other questions and other problems. And that's the idea uh, that we have in the course of never closing, the, never, we, we never arrive at, at a solution that we can relax. It's always a work in progress. It's always agonistic. We're always involved in questioning. We walk together questioning and we are never settled. Uh, and that's a, a huge let go, I think, because we are taught that there are solutions and that once you get the solution, you can sit down and relax. And the course actually goes in a different direction to, so that we can build the resilience to, to walk together. And in walking together, there is no rest because we don't arrive at the place. We just make the road by walking. And it's the walking that changes us and that changes the destination where we're going to. So these questions take us in that direction. So the first question is, how can we resist hegemo hegemony or hegem hegemonies without transforming our resistance into a new hegemony? How can we address ethnocentrism without falling into absolute relativism? How can we address ahistoricism without using history to simply reverse hierarchies? How can we address depoliticization without hijacking the political agenda for self-serving ends? How can we address salvationism without crushing generosity and altruism? How can we challenge the push for uncomplicated solutions without producing paralysis and hopelessness? And how can we address paternalism without closing important opportunities for redistribution? So thank you so much for watching the video. I hope you enjoy the texts. If you have any questions, please let me know uh, by email and I will post an answer directly to you or in the FAQ section on the website. Thank you very much and good luck. Bye-bye.